Okay, so I want to say a few more things about realism and, and liberalism and then highlight just a few things about some other theories of international relations. All right, so if we think about realism, the focus of the analysis for realists is the struggle for power among states in that anarchic international system that I talked about before. So the major actors for realists are states, and these states are rational, and they are unitary actors. By rational, we mean they have an economic perspective, or let me rephrase that. We're borrowing from the economic uh, discipline about what rationality means. The idea that they are rational, that doesn't mean crazy or not crazy. It means states act rationally in order to make decisions. So a rational actor is one who has an ordered preferences. They have their list of things they would like to accomplish in some ordered fashion, and they choose them. Uh, they choose the option that's going to provide the most utility. A unitary actor means that the black box of the state is going to speak with one voice. They can squabble all they want domestically, but eventually out pops an international level uh, decision making or, or decision, uh, what we'll call for a foreign policy. All right, the goal of the state is to enhance their power, thereby enhancing their security. That's what is the real concern of most realists is the, the protection of the state. And so the key concepts that we tend to think about are the security dilemma already described before, power politics, anarchy, self-help system, um, and all that is indicative or describes the realist perspective. Okay. Um, the strengths of realism is that it's simple, it's straightforward, and there's historical evidence to help support the theory. On the other hand, critics argue that there's, much too, uh, there's too much emphasis on conflict, that realists tend to underestimate the role of international institutions in promoting cooperation. There's too much emphasis on nation states and not enough uh, attention paid to, toward other actors in the international system. And perhaps um, most importantly, the international uh, realism cannot explain the end of the Cold War. So it has a hard time explaining peaceful change. For realists, the way that you have a change in the distribution of power in the international system is through war. And the demise of the bipolar system at the end of the Cold War into a unipolar system isn't explained very well through realist behavior. All right, for liberalism, the focus is on enhancing global uh, political and economic cooperation. And so beyond just the state, other actors are IGOs, NGOs, and multinational corporations. So states aren't always seeking rational behavior so much as they are seeking compromise that occurs between various uh, interests within the states in order to provide cooperation across states. So the goals of states from a, a liberal perspective is economic prosperity and stability. So economics plays a huge role in the liberal paradigm. Um, the key concepts, again, we can kind of think of as IGOs, international law, collective security, economic interdependence. Um, and so kind of think of anything that is cooperative, if you will, is, is pretty much something that would fall into the liberal uh, key concept bucket. Of course, there are strengths to liberalism. Helps explain cooperation in an international system which would, at first glance, uh, suggests that cooperation isn't beneficial. Um, it also helps under, uh, to understand uh, the economic, uh, economics of, of international relations. But some of the weaknesses is that they don't explain um, or have a hard time explaining some of the conflict that does occur in spite of cooperation. And many people argue that in the end, the weakness is that push comes to shove, states are going to fall back on national security as their number one concern. All right, but there's other theories. Constructivism, for example. Okay. Constructivists are, uh, it's, it's a more recent theoretical perspective, and constructivists are looking at how and why we arrived at the current state of affairs and international relations. And basically, they argue that the structure of the international system, whether it's bipolar, multipolar, or what have you, is not an all-determining um, factor in how states behave. 
Okay. They don't believe that anarchy has some sort of unavoidable de deterministic impact on the behavior of states. Remember, realists argue that because of anarchy, states behave a certain way. Liberals pay attention to anarchy, but says it can be overcome. Constructivist says that's not the case at all. In fact, Alexander Wendt, who is probably one of the most famous constructivists, says anarchy is what states make of it. He says, while anarchy permits the realist world of power politics and self-help to emerge, it does not always by itself necessitate such a response. So what's really important are the role of human actors and those human beings as active agents in understanding and expressing their ideas. So basically, this concept of anarchy is what states make of it is almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. If states believe that anarchy is going to lead to war, then that's likely what's going to happen. So constructivist tends to focus more on the ideas and norms of individuals and societies and how they help construct, if you will, behavior of states. So you have these changing ideas and understandings of the world that play an important role in why states behave the way they do. So individuals and non-state actors are key to the promotion of these ideas. And one of the best examples is Gorbachev's new thinking, if you will, about how um, relations should be or how the Soviet Union should pursue its interests. Okay, um, So we will see as we move forward that human rights has a lot of, uh, or constructivism has a lot of influence on the human rights field. Of course, there's feminism. And feminism is a political movement as well as a theoretical movement. And feminist scholarship um, became pretty prominent uh, toward the late 80s, early 90s in the field of IR. And basically what this scholarship asserts is that realism is basically a male perspective on how the world of international relations works. So they argue that realist is a gendered perspective. And they look at not only who is engaged in international relations theory, which has been traditionally men, and foreign policy maker has been the per foreign policy making has been the purview of men. Feminists also look at the issues that states find important and point to the idea that because men have run states that the issues that are important to women and children and specifically have been, if not ignored, at least not put into an um, at the top of the list. So feminists tend to argue um, that a shift needs to occur in terms of not only who is engaged in scholarship, who's engaged in leadership in terms of states, but also the issues that are being uh, considered by both states and scholars. Marxists look at the class as the driving factor in both domestic relations as well as international relations. Okay. Um, they agree with realists that perhaps conflict is inevitable. However, they tend to focus on, on the socioeconomic classes as the key actors and say that these classes will indeed conflict with one another. And we'll talk a lot more about Marxism when we focus in on the issues of economic development and how that might affect human rights violations. Okay, so again, that's just a very brief overview of the theories, and as we move through the semester and these theories come up, I will provide more information about them.